right? And it'd be cool if you know you never lost your content again. Uh, taking this a step further with stability, how many of you have ever done like the upgrading aspect before? Where you've like updated a plugin and updated core, and like one of them needs to go first, and it's kind of like the you know the chicken and the egg, and you have all these really problems, it's just a catch twenty two. Uh, we can get better at this. We kind of tell you plugin compatibility of like the current version and the next version, but not really very well. Right? I mean, every, who's obviously done the upgrade yes? Right? With something. Thank you. All right. Uh, Kismet was a, was, was a particularly fun one. Where, like, we would update over it, and the Kismet would update, and it was back and forth. Um, we can get better at these things, and we can make this so it's a lot better for, for plugins, for plugin authors, which we're actually going to get into later. So, ultimately, you should be able to update without fear. And this, I mean, this really takes uh, uh, many more forms. The idea of updating without fear also means that, I mean, well, let's talk about this next concept of seamless updates. Uh, perfect example is, so who uses Firefox here? So what version of Firefox do you run? 3.6, 4, 5, in about a month and a half, I think, you'll be running 6. Maybe if you update, maybe if your plugins don't break, right? Um, who uses Chrome? What version of Chrome do you run? Do you even know one? You're like 13, I think, maybe 14. Some of you on the dev build, Canary, maybe. I don't even know. I think it's like 12. So yeah, yes, I think it's 12. Like I think I'm on 13 because I run beta, but like, who knows, right? That number just keeps incrementing. We're going to get like 26 in a few days. <laughs> so, who's on Facebook? Come on, really? Like five hands? <laughs> 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 what version of Facebook do you run? Huh. Yeah, it's six. <laughs> That's Internet Explorer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, like, you don't know, right, what version of Facebook do you run? So we can actually start getting this more automated with WordPress. That probably scares the hell out of some of you that have had sites break on an update. But we can do a lot more to actually make this make it more seamless. So as an example, with 3.2, if you guys are all running 3.2.1, yeah. last up, yes? Yeah, please. Um, so with 3.21, if you actually were on 3.2.0 and you updated a 3.2.1, uh, the update took about six seconds rather than normal like 30 seconds to a minute or five minutes. And the reason is actually because we're now serving partial builds for them. Very similar to what Chrome is doing, where they're actually getting files. Uh, instead of sending four megabytes back, we're actually only sending about 173 kilobytes back. 3.5 percent of the data we're actually delivering to update your site. And when you update the 322, if that ever happens, it'll be just as quick. Now, unfortunately, when you go to 33 again, uh, which will be out later this year, you know you'll have to get the whole package again. But we can start to actually make this a little better. Now, the great thing is that partial builds actually. Um, they make things just much more seamless across the board because it's going to be quicker. It's actually a lot less bandwidth for us. We've saved, we've saved terabytes of bandwidth by being able to serve just small files, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. And then on top of that, it's also uh, it, less things are going to break. We're not transferring uh, 1,060 files. We're actually transferring 29, and we're copying over 29. And the, the, the amount of I.O. that's actually changing there, it's just, it's kind of amazing that we can just update a site, uh, you know, with four files. And now some of you are running years, it's done. And like one of those files is the read I mean, really, like there's not much going on. This is really helpful for stability. And, and so, let's load on the server. Let's load on the server. So finally, the dream here is automatic updates. And it's a fairly lofty goal. And to start with, you probably have to be optimized, maybe for minor builds. But this is doable. We've, we've already started like, experimenting with plugins to update automatically. And there's, yeah, there's a plugin now that will actually update your site automatically. It's out there. One of the other core developers is writing. Uh, and the idea is that maybe, you know, when a security release comes out, every site has it within 12 hours. Not really bad, is it? Like, that's kind of cool. Uh, that, that, you know, the whole idea of like, stability and security and being safe, like, that's really important. Um, I like to get it even lower than 12 hours, but I mean, considering that sometimes sites are going weeks without being secure, this is just one really cool step. And on top of that, it lets us go in faster cycles. So, if you see Firefox, they just bump to I think, like six to eight week release cycle, yeah. same with Chrome, and they can push features out the door. So, we can start developing features and plugins, and then as soon as the release comes out, or even when it's in the release candidate, start pulling them into core. And then we can start adding more and more things, making WordPress better and faster. And the nice thing about here too is that you know some of you probably are still scared about my plugins are going to break. I'm deactivating this the moment you guys put it in core. Well, here's some of the other things we can do. First off, when the update when the update is done, we can actually check to see if we broke anything. 
we can actually check the front page and see, oh crap, did we break something? And what do we do? Could you have to get a plug if we can switch the default to use it? Roll everything back. Why not? You can. It's, it's so entirely doable. We'll just roll things back. We can actually set WordPress up in a parallel directory. Why not? You can actually test it out, click around, see if it works. If it works, great. Click the next button and everything will go. Um, this is just kind of like the idea of like, what else can we do to make this better? What else can we do to make this more seamless? Want to be more like Chrome, uh, Facebook, Firefox. Uh, you know, this is you know when a lot of other systems have you know 18 to 24 to 36 month release cycles, and we have a three or four month release cycle that you know, you're just getting you're just getting it when it's ready. That's like pro for everyone, right? Uh, one of the big things with WordPress, like you're not you don't run WordPress free. You don't run WordPress 3.1. You run WordPress. You have this idea of like you're always going to be backwards compatible. You should always be able to update. And so, you know, maybe we can just make that a little better. I'll talk. Quick question about that. A number of WordPress pieces require database upgrades of one sort or another. How would you handle rolling back in that scenario? Uh, so part of the rollback would then be we actually don't do a database upgrade immediately. Uh, we actually don't do it until the following page load. Uh, so we're actually able to check to see what's actually going on there. Uh, WordPress will run without the database being upgraded for at least like a page load. Otherwise, things will really break. Uh, and actually, we haven't done a database upgrade in a while, and I don't expect us to do too much more. Um, so things are looking pretty good there. Uh, I mean, obviously, we would figure it out. It's one of those problems that we may need to solve. But they're solved. They're solved. Hopefully. Okay. Right. So, next, ease of use and new ways of post. WordPress has a bunch of wonderful UIs, but I, I recently had the pleasure of watching some people user test and do a focus group. And they looked at the dashboard and they stared at the blank. They, they had no idea what to do. There were so many links and we couldn't guide them through it. So what can we do to make it better for new users? What can we do to make it more seamless for advanced users without burdening our user base? Because ultimately, UX is everything. Now, we could do a ton of different things. In 3.3, one of the things we're looking at doing is adding a wealth of something for new users. So when a new user comes, it says, you know what, you want to post. That's the first thing someone wants, is just to see a post generally. So that would guide you through to do that. And, oh, you want to change your site title. This is how you can do that too. But ultimately, that's kind of just a stopgap. Because telling, some, telling someone what to do is not a solution for having something that's obvious. And so we should build interfaces that are better. We should iterate. And people should take plugins and try to build better. Another thing we're looking at is improving press this. Who uses press this right now? Yeah, I see like seven hands. So bookmarklets are kind of dying. Their bookmarks bars are not being shown in browsers by default anymore. And really the only reason I show my bookmarks bar at all is because I want to see a bookmarklet. Except now some of my bookmarklets are in Chrome extensions or Firefox extensions. And so we want to revamp our this and make it really good at detecting the content that's on it, make it easy to vlog something. And then, oh, you don't want to use a bookmarklet? Well, we have a visual like Firefox, Chrome, Safari, maybe an internet store. Oh, it's not <laughs> Max, do you want to write that one for us? No, he doesn't want to write that one. So. Uh, and you know, this idea of like, if we can just take, you know, where is the internet going? Where is it evolving? I mean, especially with browser extensions, this is important. Press this. So much of the internet now is, is curation, and it's you know you're going through all of your content. I mean, I mean this is in many like the, the bookmark of the Tumblr is actually one of the many reasons why Tumblr like in many ways took off for microblogging. Uh, it's really effective, but it's also effective for, for mobile blogging and for content management. Uh, we heard you know, in the, the last talk with Martin West talking about you know how they actually use press this with own bed and some other crazy voodoo to create something really cool with you know this idea of like uh, like shooting posts and that you know these. These ways of like extending the content further, you know, beyond what the author is actually doing, uh, and there are a lot of other things that we can do with user experience. Uh, another really good example is content management. How many of you guys get a lot of comments on the blog? How many? I mean, do, does anyone? No one gets any comments on their blog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, who has used the, the the keyboard shortcuts? Believe it or not, we have them. That's in your Gmail and like, like two hands. Actually, it's Gmail shortcut. We had no idea that we had comment shortcuts for moderation. Honestly, no idea whatsoever. Mark didn't even know. Yeah, there you go. Um, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like all these different things with you know comment moderation.
generation, like we can make this better. But we have this hierarchy, we have nation, and you know, making this just much more serious. Well, ultimately, comments are where the discussion is on your blog, is how you interact with people. You know, in our model, you know, you have the site, if you're posting, you control what goes on your front page, but then we have conversation. That's, to me, that's one of the best parts about WordPress is that it enables people to talk and discuss what they're comment, and so you should be able to change it. Now, one of the other things is that when you go to the dashboard, who, who like uses the dashboard? Actually, not, not like the, the dashboard page. Does anyone use it and look at it frequently? Like, right now, there's some comments, comments, a few other things in there. Yeah, that, see, that's my point. And so we, we should really have a useful dashboard. Right? And, and it's not that hard. Because right now, we have the meta boxes on the dashboard. And it's really useful for right now. It's useful for some stats plugins. It's useful for the new browser checks. Does any who knows about um, Browse Happy by the way? Has anyone seen it? Why are you guys running old browsers? <laughs> Walk into that. One. Sorry. Um, if you're using like an old browser version of Firefox, let me tell you, like Firefox four, which was new as of a month ago, it's now old. Uh, it's we're just fine, right? We're talking about how the version number is kind of dying. Uh, you know, you, we're not telling you. Hey, just let you know, update. Your i7, you actually can do a big red box and say, hey, it's such an update. And for kids, it actually doesn't even look very good in i7. It's just like the box is kind of like the form. Because uh, <laughs> you can't make it pretty, because it's i7. It's i7. So. But those are really the only things that the dashboard is used for. Other than that, like some plugins add boxes and their news feeds, or their news feeds of the plugin authors, things like that. And users don't know how to remove them, or they can't remove them, but you want to use the plugin because the plugin is useful. You know, how can we make that page a page where, since it's the first thing that you view, you're actually like, oh, let me see what's going on in my blog, as opposed to being like, oh, where do I click to leave? Now, another thing is that WordPress is a text-based platform, right? So posts and pages and everything are really centered around text. Our, our editor interface is centered around text. And we can do better. So who knows about post formats? Yeah. All right. Post formats were a, a new spec introduced recently, and all they are is basically a radio box and themes can handle them differently. But ultimately, it's the same editor, and so it doesn't help you if you click the image post format and then you just have to like still go through the media interface and it doesn't know if you need an image and the theme's confused. We should have better interfaces for each of these formats. For audio, it should automatically pull in a short code or some kind of a plug that's registered it, or a theme knows how to display it. Same goes for video, same goes for images, same goes for quotes. It, we should know how to display these things and optimize our interfaces for these different types of content, because then blogs can be focused on something other than text. Then our editor can use, like, guide people towards things other than text, because I know so many people they use WordPress for their blog and they type their thoughts and it's great. But when you want to just post some silly images or you want to just do something that's quick and fast, quotes, minor things, it's it's on top of it. Their interface or well, Cosmos or any of these other services that had interfaces to customize for those things. There you go. That's what I use. Yeah. So uh, I mean some of this too it has to do with you know the idea of like a you know text group and in many cases content management is a lot more than that. Uh, so many uses of, co of content types don't really involve using the editor, or they have like five editors on a page. And they have all these different things that they're actually storing and doing and modifying to actually get the fit into the, into the existing UI to make it work for these specific kinds of content. You saw in the last presentation where you know with their with their Jiffy Post plugin, and you have you know they they use the editor but not the real one. They actually create their own because they have four or five different things that they're doing with the URL and the team URL and parsing it. This idea of like you know. Your content is more than just a body of text, right? It, it is in many cases. Now, in, in many cases, it won't be, which is great. I and mean, then you can use like distracted writing, which is like, actually a really good example of the user experience for those of you who use it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, when you're doing like full content management, you know, this is actually this this is probably like one step in the right direction. I hope. And on top of that, so one of the common threads of post formats is that. Since we have all these great text processing tools, we have a huge deficiency in our memories. I think so. And what we really need to improve to get there is media. We, we really need to approach media and try and rework some of that work. <laughs> Um, 
I I just like uploading images in WordPress. I can't stand it. Yeah. That'd be crazy. I apologize when I teach people. Yeah, I actually do that. There you go. Uh, I'm sorry. I know you want to upload it every time. But the scary thing is that it's better than almost every other system out there. It really is. Uh, Google Plus has actually been fantastic for uploads. It's really cool. Drag and drop, very slick. You reorder, very easy. Uh, but and that's you know that's the, that might be like one of the best examples out there right now. It's like two and sold. And it was done by a giant team of Google engineers. Yeah. <laughs> so one step at a time, there are some things that we can do a lot sooner. That's drag and drop uploader. You're working on it for free. There's another summer code project doing that now. Nice um, interruption. Uh, There's so many different things we can do with media. Uh, so the idea of a drag and drop uploader and a new media workflow. So right now when you click the button, you get the pop-up, and you're just you have to upload media. It's like upload media now, here's a pop-up, here's a browser button. We can actually take that back in line again. And you click that, maybe it'll like open up and you'll be able to do whatever you need to do with images, and you can do other things like writing your content while the images are actually crunching and getting them sized. All these different things can happen. Drag and drop, maybe right into the editor or reordering a gallery. You can do all these different things. If you have an iPad, that'd be even cooler, right? You can just reorder everything and just drag it in. Um, and just, uh, there's just all these different random things we can do to just make any workflow in WordPress just 10 times better, 30 times better. See, here's the thing WordPress is hugely capable. You can do so much of it. But at the same time, there are certain things that aren't all of it. And there's something to say about an interface that is small and focused and does one thing really, really well. Because sometimes you can have something that, to implement it's easy, but to get people to use it and to get people to understand it, that's the hard part. And not only do we do the easy things, we implement the hard things. And we also need the people on board to be able to build these things so that people can actually use them and understand them. And, you know, Admin, so it's better, just better. And on top of that, to do some of that, we're using progressive enhancement. So behind that is a nice little HTML5 logo. I you know it's a buzzword, but you know it's a buzzword. We're using. <laughs> and on top of that, you know we started doing CSS3 gradients in 3.1, and in 3.2 with distraction rewriting and the admin style refresh. We're actually using those animations, the fade in and out on distraction free writing, or the collapsed menu um, on the admin refresh, or the uh, username drop down. All those animate. All of those are CSS3 transitions and transforms. There's no JavaScript there. That's just you know made to look good, to work well. Part of it is that in, uh, in distraction free writing, the border fades out. And it actually fades to transparent. So if you want to plug it, sit in behind it, you won't see these dashed lines. And every single thing I've looked for from JavaScript initially didn't work. It faded black, it broke, it faded to the color. I think I have no idea why. And every single browser that implemented it with CSS3, smooth, native, worked perfectly. And it was a no-brainer decision. If you're in IE, you just see it flash out. We, we've had this idea for a really long time where we need to take care of our users. We can't make political statements on behalf of our users. Great example is page before. Even now, there are still more than a million, probably two million sites running page before. But certainly just drop support for that, that that's really lame. Four percent for us is still a few million users. We can't just abandon all. We had to support that for a long time. But now we're kind of like now like we need to push up like page five but on the front, we can actually start doing very serious, just cutting edge progressive enhancement. And I think that's really part of our goals here. You are seeing things right now that we can do suddenly that you couldn't do in Chrome 12, or now in Chrome 13, or whatever it is. Why not do it? Uh, something like HTML5 notifications. So for example, if you're doing like auto saves, and maybe like someone else breaks your lock on a post or something like that, why not have an HTML5 notification that comes up and says, hey, just to let you know, you know, Daryl just overrode your post. We can do this. Now, will it work in your Internet Explorer? No, I'm sorry, it won't. It won't even work in like Firefox 4. But it will work in, in later browsers. It will work in you know, Chrome 27 or Chrome 14. We have all these opportunities. So there's all these different kinds of little progressive enhancements we can do um, that just makes WordPress so much better. And the great thing is that the more we work with progressive enhancement this way, the more that, that themes and plugins can capitalize, you know, directly on top of our administration. Things. You know, this talk is a lot about core, but it's also in many ways this idea of like, 
you know, hopefully get in your mind going, I'm like, what can your plugin do? How can you guys extend what we're working on? How can you take this to the next step? So many different ways that, you know, we can provide you different tools. And we're actually going to get into that in a moment as well. So, we, like, we all, right now, access the admin on computers for the most part, with laptops, and we have our mobile devices, and the applications are good, you know, they work, but they're not fully featured. And we should be able to run WordPress, we should be able to run the admin on other devices, and not only should we do that, they should be customized to work better on certain devices. So, one thing that we're looking at, again, for 3.3, is responsive admin provider. So, once you view the admin on an iPad, it's touch sensitive, so none of the public stuff is there. It looks good. You can zoom, you can edit your posts. We still have yet to figure out what it is on the icon. If any of you are UI people, you should totally help out. We have a UI team. Sarah Cannon from the audience is on our UI team. She gave a talk on responsive admin yesterday. She's actually beating up the effort to make the admin responsive and free What a coincidence. Um, there, we, there's so many different things we can do with, I mean, so everyone here, most of you here, probably 90% of you have an Android, an iPhone, a Blackberry, uh, what, anything else that I'm missing? I mean, like, the list of the big three, right? iPads, most of you, probably just some of you, for sure, have them. There's all these, you know, we have all these mobile apps. We have, like, seven mobile apps at this point. And those are, you know, they're going to get better. Uh, oh, sorry, with this one, seven. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, and, but, like, we can make all the apps better, but again, like, we can make, like, the admin better. We can just make it work. I would love to be able to, you know, use my, my touch screen or my iPad just on the admin. Why not? You know, it's, uh, I've actually, in the last two weeks, I've updated two different WordPress sites on the iPad. The early is pretty cool, actually. It works very well. I'm kind of a little nervous when you, like, push the button on an iPad to, like, go FTP in case something goes wrong. Uh, but, like, it's, like, we can do a lot of different things there, you know, that just make it even cleaner, make it better. Why not be able to just write the digital editor? You can in mobile safari. And on top of that, take it the other way. How many people have like a large external monitor or just a desktop computer? Or for example, this projector, which is 19, 20 pixels wide. We should have the admin be responsive. Have you ever viewed the admin on a screen that's 2,000 pixels wide? It's like, you know, okay, useful, useful, like, bring. 1,400 pixels of white space. <laughs> you know, white space is good, but it's not that good. <laughs> so, so we need to adapt. So for example, the widget screen, how you can drag to sidebars. Why do they need to be stacked? I always need to scroll down, and then you know, one's expanded, and or you have to expand the sidebar you want. What if they stack sideways in columns? How about that? What if when you dragged over a title, the sidebar expanded? You know, these are things we can do. Not that hard, and this is really the state of the web today. The widget screen is like that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Because I have this, you know, I have this large monitor, and I would like to be able to see all the different like five, six columns. Why not? It's easily doable. Yeah. Can you talk about how you uh, get input from from users, and what, what's the best way for you know people and not people not in the audience to get their opinions to you? Um, so we can talk about that probably later on in this presentation there. Uh, but uh, also, I mean, this, so currently there's an ideas for us on WordPress uh, The WordPress of Art extend ideas. Uh, we're also working on a, a new a new place. It should be ready in the next few weeks, I think. It's it's going to be a little while. It, it might be a little while. Uh, a, a, new, <laughs> a, a new place for suggestions. That you can actually go in, and submit a suggestion, and actually vote up and down how all these different areas. Uh, and also, I, I think we also want to get to talk a little bit about contributing as well. I think we want to get many of you involved. I think maybe many of you are kind of excited about some people that you want to work on. Maybe. And it's kind of the idea of talk, so I hope so. And if you're developers, right, like we have these suggestions, things for users, right, which is what you're asking about, but for developers, you can get involved in other ways and really start proposing changes and patches and become part of the process. It's not hard, it's not scary. I, I don't think we bite, so. How much? Uh, if you guys, like, how many of you are plugin authors here? We actually didn't really ask this, I guess. Yeah. Number of plugin authors? How many like new plugin authors? Like people who are just kind of starting out, like not that, you know, or like if you want to just write a plugin one day, you're just bored on a Sunday afternoon or something like that. Go to the ideas forum, find an idea. Most of these aren't as a lot of these aren't going to necessarily have traction for core. But it might make a really, really cool plugin. Find an idea, say, I want to create that, and just go out and do it. Even then, or you don't know how to do it first, and you have to work. So next, 
Who read the post for 3.2, the announcement post? All right, that's like a few hands. But the mission statement of 3.2 was lighter and faster. But really, it should be every release. And we plan on doing an every release. WordPress core is meant to be light and lean. And we believe that we should really have features that cater to 80% of our users. If the feature is really an edge case, then it should be in core. It's probably a button character, but we should always be making things better. Right? So one good example of this in the admin is instant results. So you should be able to navigate to pages without full page loads. Um, we can use um, different things in JavaScript. We can use AJAX. We can use push state, which is a new um, API to allow you to change the page URLs. Without actually changing the page. Yeah, so we can keep the Chrome. We can, it can all stay the same. The header can stay the same. The footer can stay the same. The sidebar can stay the same. But we can change the content of the page. Same with the list table. So we have, you know, you're, you're browsing your posts. And you have like 20,000 posts or something you search, and it's a page load, and then you click a new page, and it's a page load. Everything is a page load, and it's slow, and it refreshes. Instead, we should just pull the content that we need. But part of this is especially tricky for us, because in WordPress, plugins can do anything. And so we need a good way of communicating this to plugins without breaking backwards compatibility, because that is one of our biggest biggest things. A lot of problems we need to solve. But we've already done it in a few times. So as an example, in WordPress 3.1 with internal linking, if you actually search for a post and you want to then scroll down for more results, uh, that just keep, that's an infinite stream. It just keeps going. And it will just keep loading them up through you know, through, through just exit target points. And this this idea of like how else can we make the internet faster, whether it's list tables, individual pages, settings, all these are behaviors that we can do this. Why not? And that kind of takes us to like one of our big points here is actually just you know, there is a version one, but there's also going to be a V2. Iterate, iterate, iterate. We can continue to make things better. And the funny thing is that if you're in any of our developer chats, the people who are contributors in the audience know this, V1, just the term V1 is thrown around all over the place. We have relatively fast releases. We want to get something done. We want to put it out. And when you're building a feature, one of the most important things is to determine what is the most important part of this feature. What do the users need? What do the developers need? How can we implement it? And where can we kind of say, all right, that sounds great. We should do it, but later. The thing is that sometimes we're not so good at getting around with that. Right? So one of the things we were playing around with in menus when it was in development was instead of doing the checkboxes inside and clicking add to menu and popping to the bottom, being able to select several items and then dragging them over right into the menu. Just pure drag and drop. And also having that as a menu option. And you know, we were working on developing it, and we were experiment experimenting with it in core, but by that point, we were really late in the cycle. And it was like, we can't do this. We can't put this in right now. It really needs to stay the way it is so we can make it stable so our users can you know, benefit from it. But we should go back. We should go back and take a look at all the features and make them better. There's not that much that we need to add to WordPress right now. Not many features that we need to add to core to make it better. <clears throat> what we really need to do is just refine it over and over. Take what we do, reimagine it, and say what's the best way to go about this thing. What, how, how can our users understand best? How can our developers understand best? How can we encourage them to build better things on our platform and on our platform? There was a great essay written by Matt Molloy, founder of WordPress. Uh, it, late, late last year, it was called One is the Loneliest, Loneliest Number. You should not be satisfied with what you ship as a V1. You shouldn't be. Uh, you should want to be able to make improvements to it. You if, if you're satisfied with V1, then you ship too late. And that's actually one of the reasons why you, know, you want to be able to ship often and early. So, the last thing is also optimization. You know, 3.2 admin UI is faster. There are several performance enhancing things that we did to just, you know, how the uh, Menus on the side. When you used to load the page, it would freeze, and then all of a sudden they would slide down the open ones. And so you try to click something, and then it would start moving. Now they just the ones that are open they pop up and they stay open. And we also take a look at our queries. We want to reduce the query. We want to look at all the nitty gritty stuff and say, all right, is this page loading fast? The speed, speed is everything. And if people are using your application and it takes a ton of time to load, then you know they're going to leave. They're going to stop using it. For example, in Tiny FCE, sometimes you know you'll watch the editor build itself. So you'll see the text set, you'll see the text area, and the text is actually hidden now. But then you see it, and it's kind of like imposing. You see some buttons pop in, 
and then you see a toolbar pop down, and then you see it pop up, and eventually it loads. You know, we should have something that maybe blocks that off and lets it do its thing. <laughs> and with something, <laughs> it has to make it faster. Like that. Yeah, whatever we can do to make it faster to make it better. So it's, it's certainly not sexy, but profiling is just really important. There's a lot more we can do. Uh, so for developers now, this gets to be a pretty fun section, hopefully, is you want to talk about some next generation question? Uh, I just uh, a little bit of time, but I was just curious um, if you guys thought at all about uh, having a pretty good idea of the app, but working with the app, for example, you know, Facebook is trying to sell so that you can probably get rid of the first content. Have you guys thought about So, it, um, I, I, is, can you like repeat the question? I think I get, know what you're getting at, which is that, like, are, are we thinking of getting out of the admin and more into the site? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I was having this conversation with a few people earlier, which is that um, our model is different. So, Facebook and Google Plus, you know, you're kind of permanently in a dashboard. You can't customize the appearance of your site. And so, you're consuming everything and posting something, and it's just like the text content or the image content, and you're using it a lot. Now, you start moving backwards, you have Twitter. You can customize your background and your colors a little bit, but how many people actually see that page when they're using Twitter? Almost everyone is exclusively using apps. Even the web app doesn't really show it. And so that is, you know, you have that customization, but if you're not seeing it, you're almost permanently in the dashboard. Same thing with Tumblr, really, which is that you have more customization. You can do your layout of your site, but a huge, huge percentage of the patients are through the dashboard, through the reader. And we're different. Our dashboard is more personal. Our dashboard is more your site. And one of the huge benefits of WordPress is being able to have a theme and be able to choose how you present your content. And there are certain types of posts and certain sites where the experience, you know, is everything. And really, for any site, the experience matters. That's part of why we need to have great themes. But on top of that, that's part of why we need to kind of keep the dashboard a little separate from the content. And we can build the type of reader. You know, we, we could do a thing like that, and it could work, and it could be there for people who want to opt in, people who want to use RSS and opt in, and all these great different things. But, at least personally, I, I think the focus should also be on the site and the experience and kind of having that in the other way. I know there's a great story in the brain that are actually really cool. Just keep going, bro. Sorry. I'm just wondering if you're reading right now. Well, that's actually a really good point, is that with, so with the admin bar, there's a great example of this. Uh, many people got the admin bar, they didn't necessarily like it at first, they're like, I don't know why I need this. The best thing about the admin bar is what we can build on top of it in the future. Really is, like, that is key to a lot of other things. What if you just had, you know, so there's an add a new button, what if, like, it was just a new post button and just slid down a new post window, like WordPress? Uh, almost like press this for your own site. Now you can just suddenly slam off, you know, a piece of content or something like that. Maybe that then takes you to leave in with your bot. Another great example is the debug bar. For those of you who have heard of it, it's a plugin written by probably most of the core developers at this point uh, have a hand in it. It's a really cool plugin. It's basically a firebug for your WordPress, or a Chrome inspector for your WordPress at this point. Uh, and it's, it's a really, really cool tool that enables you to, to debug all sorts of different aspects, um, you know, through, with, within WordPress, and it's built into the admin bar. Which actually makes you know the admin bar just one more step to just helping you out. There's so many different things that we can kind of start integrating from there, and so many things that plugins can start integrating into there. That you know I think there is in many ways a, a closer tie between the dashboard and the front end. The question is like, what's the best way to do that tie? Is it something like P2 with the text editor in front, or is it something like maybe like leveraging the admin bar as kind of like a tie back and forth? Part is that the admin bar. I can tell you how many times people came up to me and said, I have this great idea for the admin bar, like I have a great idea to change the design, tweak the design, you know, I would be absolutely it's, it's a really compelling feature and we can make it better. I mean that that is what you want in the admin bar right now. And in my mind, it's the bridge, right? It's what you see in both interfaces. We can make the admin bar make more sense in the dashboard and also make just as much sense on the front end. And when we're deciding to add new features like that, add new posts potentially on the front end, we have to choose them carefully. 
because most of the time, the having a separate page is beneficial because to have, to have that infusion of blurring the, the lines between site, which is completely customizable, and then you know, admin can be confusing. So when we pick those, you know, we say, all right, this is what our users need to do, and they need to do it quickly. And this is an action where you shouldn't have to go to the admin to get a short link. Like that, you should be able to click and see, and be like, oh, look, it's my short link. I can paste it. But if you're doing a lot of complex editing, you know, yeah, it's probably the place for you. So there are probably a lot of developers in the room, like getting like itch. We're talking about next generation of guys. Like, what can we do next, right? Um, so let's kind of dig into some of this. Um, there are all these different ideas, like we need to improve this, we need to improve that, we want this new thing. There are some different things that we can do. Uh, so as a good example is uh, meta and settings. Uh, both of these relate to the edge of 20 and 3.3. This is kind of slated for this. Uh, this idea that we already have this function register setting, right? Where you're, if you're using the settings API to build an options form, and you have things like the options group, you have the option name, you have the standardization callback. Well, now you can actually register metadata uh, for posts, for you know, comments, you can use this. And you can actually say, this actually then applies various different levels uh, to that piece of metadata. So for example, standardization. You can actually do that now like this. Uh, you can do it just based on registering the callback. You can register an authorization callback. So you can actually decide whether or not the user has the privileges to edit something. Now, if you think about this, when you're doing a MetaBox now, you do add MetaBox, and then you also hook in the save post. And so add MetaBox, build your form, and then save post will actually do all the saving. And you have to check like five or six things. You have to check you know, the, the, the token, the nonce, you have to check capabilities, you have to check whether or not you're, it's actually, you're accidentally working off a revision or a post type that you don't want to work off of. Uh, you also need to check uh, you know, whether or not the field is actually set, because it might not be a meta box, it might not be there. And then you actually have to deal with things like saving, and making sure that you're saving securely. And we can actually kind of start getting rid of that stuff. Um, those of you who have used, for example, widgets, WP widget is a really cool example of this. How you have very simple, very simple methods for saving, for displaying, uh, you know, both the form and the front end. And now what we can actually do is we can take this a little step further with, you know, something like a WP MetaBox class that actually will allow you to simply just hear the fields. Oh, and by the way, I've already registered the meta, or I maybe registered the meta through the class. So you should know what to do when you can save. And WordPress should just be able to take that and say, okay, I will save this data. And now suddenly your, your form building, instead of being 30 or 40 lines long, might be much shorter than that, or might be more simple than that. And you can actually spend more time, you know, instead of building your own APIs, we're actually making it for you, and we're making it a lot easier for you. Uh, and so this idea of, you know, we could do something kind of like WP Widget, where you have, you have like a save, and you have a display, a form, and things like that. But we're actually just going to like cut out most of it if we can, because we have this ability now of being able to actually register that data. So that's just one pretty interesting example. Uh, the other one, we can actually take WP Widget a bit further. What about this idea of WP plugin? Um, <laughs> good job. Yes, good. Um, so this idea about WP plugin, has anyone ever looked at a plugin that maybe like I've written or Daryl's written or any member of the core team? They actually have a very similar style. So what we do, we encapsulate everything in a class. We normally are very deliberate in our methods. So for example, like function action init is going to fire on the init action. Or maybe something like this function filter the content by is going to run on the content at priority pop. So you've actually written a, Daryl's written a, a really cool wrapper called Add Hooks that with actually goes all of this. With, uh, so mainly developer uh, Mark Jacob, we were playing around with WordCamp Savannah last year. And for the past, you know, however long, almost a year now, like we've been poking at this gist and slowly revising it and making it into something that could be an API. And there's, I mean, there's absolutely no target for core right now or anything. This is just something awesome you can do. And on top of that, this is something that we get by updating PHP 5.2. And you know, now that we in 3.2, 5.2 is our minimum. And do a lot more fun with that in 4.2. I didn't say that too loud, but Part of the problem with, uh, part of the, the this, is, this isn't necessarily solving a, an existing problem, as much as it is like it's providing another tool. Uh, you know, when you need widgets, widgets, you know, community local instances, which is why they're actually not classes. Uh, but with WP Plugin, we can actually do all sorts of things like namespacing. So not only are we namespacing based on basic methods, what if WP Plugin also had a, uh, like an 
and metabox soda. That may be a bad example because they just said that function might as well go away soon. Uh, you know, where you can just set up register setting, and it just game spaces everything for you. Add menu page. Instead of like nine arguments, it's like three, because we can guess all of them based on your plugin rank. All these different things we can do. So WP plugin can actually have like 100, 200 methods. Why not? They can have all these different things that work. Uh, that said, I mean, this isn't necessarily something that we're thinking about for core any time in the future. It's just something that we've kind of like uh, been kicking around literally for 11 months now. Just this idea of why not make it a little better. Um, there's actually a, there's a plugin, I'm sorry, there's a, a, a library called Backgrounds, which is working, a lot of the workers call that already track down. And there's another piece of system called Glockpress written on top of it. Uh, and we actually, in many ways, this idea came from uh, some of the architecture in Glockpress, which is designed for translations and internationalization. Uh, this idea that anyone can like go in and crowdsource a translation or something, and go in and actually submit a string. Right? So you can go in and like, well, my Spanish really doesn't help me much here, but I can try. Um, and this idea that I can just go in and submit a string and someone else can prove that string because I actually translated the word correctly. Uh, and you know, we're going to have 3,000 you know, strings before, and how many more thousand in plugins, which we're actually going to get into in a moment. Uh, so that's, sorry, that's kind of a tangent, but the idea that you know, the architecture in this plugin was really cool all right, in, in this project. So it's the ability to just say, like, hey, I want to just add an action, or even better, we can just read all the methods in the file and filter them out based on whether they say action or filter them automatically add them. We're actually cutting out a lot of code that you might need to write with stuff like this. And on top of that, the one really common thread through all of these uh, APIs is that just like we want to make things easier for users and you know themes, we want themes to encourage users to have a good design on their sites, because there's nothing worse than seeing a site and like, you know, it's neon green and orange and paint and like you're blinded. Same thing with developers. You know, you don't want to cringe when you look at someone's code. And more importantly, you don't want developers to write insecure code. So one of the most important things in that Metabox class is the fact that we can protect against certain security vulnerabilities by default. Same thing with WP plugin. When, when we are writing these APIs, they should guide developers towards better code. They should teach developers better practices, best practices, and they should build them in. Uh, so on top of that, we can also do a number of uh, little things. This is actually an idea that was proposed by, I'm on two mics now. Uh, this is an idea that was proposed by uh, Amy Skelton, who's a developer on that. The idea of like presentational interfaces. The idea like a WP host class. So normally when you call get host, you get back a basic object. Basic page, page, and the class object. It really doesn't do anything. It's not very decorative. What if we did decorate? What if you could just call it a content method? Uh, what if you could just call a permalink method directly on that? And now suddenly, instead of you know doing things like calling the content in a loop, we can actually take this you know way further. So if you're doing custom loops or a lot of custom things, you actually have various different methods just on a WP post object. Or uh, this is not something that's necessarily going to happen in the next three months or six months or a year. I'm just throw it out there. Like, this is just an idea that someone has thrown out that we like. Uh, maybe like the WP comment one. Uh, Andy has actually specifically said that this is great because we can finally get rid of comment underscore post underscore capital ID. Uh, if you've ever used that one in a plugin, you kind of get covers from the type all the time. We can actually make this a lot better. We can actually clean up a lot of different interfaces by creating these various different presentational interfaces. And part of this, and part of what we're talking about this, is that when we're putting these things in core, whenever we add a book, whenever we add an action, whenever we add anything at all, and especially classes, developers are using them. So every one of you who's a developer in this room could potentially be using this code. And we have to add things carefully, because again, we believe very heavily in backwards compatibility. So we take all these things into account when we're developing an API. We say, all right, well, what's going to happen if we want to change this in the future? What if for V2, like, we're doing this thing, this isn't going to be compatible with where we want to go? Or you know, this could be dangerous. Sometimes it bites us. Like we're just gonna try and get rid of some of the widgets compatibility code from a two point two. Yeah. Like it's like years years, years, years back. And it's been the bane of everyone's existence. And so when people go like, why don't you just optimize widgets and redo it? Do everything like that. But that's three versions of code in it. And you have to support it's all three. Yeah. It's great. So there are still plugins that use the really, really old APIs, which in many ways come out of a lot of education. And, and we check. We have a lot of the developers have full checkouts of the plugin repository 
we search through them to see who's using our API. It takes about like maybe an hour to get through the whole directory on search. Yeah, it's like 20,000 plugins that are searching for to see if there are eight of them that happen to use a filter that we added five years ago. And now we need to contact those eight plugins and say, hey guys, uh, we're going to change this. I'm just let you know. It can be very complicated. There's a lot going on there. Uh, it's a huge ecosystem. Obviously, there are a lot of plugins that aren't public. There's so many more things that are going on. You can't just, you know, we have to be very careful with that. We had a lot of issues with uh, with 3.2 with like JSON, and it actually only affected a lot. It seemed like it affected every plugin out there. It affected four of them, total four, and yet that still affects you know maybe a hundred thousand. So there's obviously a problem with to do. That actually goes back to like the Punnett square problem too. It's taking before the egg and catch 22 on updating a plugin. So the point being, when we develop these APIs, we need to be careful. But you do not need to be careful to play with the ideas and test them, and so. See this code, like look it up, work with it, and try and make it better yourselves, and then come back, contribute, tell us, and we'll build something that's completely awesome and makes it really easy for you know at least eighty percent of our developers to make great science. We have, well, we have, there are a lot of developers that go out there and they write something and they notice something. I mean, over brunch this morning, they were talking about like how we could possibly put a query on a very specific page. One query, but that one query can improve how many logs. How many, how many sites can make you better by that one query? Uh, little things like, um, uh, starting with Frederick Counts, uh, a lot lately on like how he's working on performance improvements for W3 Total Cache. How can we actually, you know, what other things can we do in core that he's noticed that we can actually improve? So there were some APIs he wasn't using because they weren't very well in terms of performance. And now he's using them, and now he's going to, you know, hopefully get a chance to contribute back and be able to actually submit some of that, some of that back to us. Then, you know, that, that kind of collaboration is really, really important because I guarantee you that most developers out here have worked around a bug or something that doesn't really perform quite up to your standards or something like that. And many of you probably had a bother you to actually like say something. Uh, and that's actually really, it's really helpful when we start to hear that kind of feedback. So, let's talk about you a little bit. <laughs> uh, so, in many ways, this is a lot of what I work on, improving WordPress I work. Uh, I work with Otto. Uh, many of you may have seen him in the support forums before. He's been around for many years. Uh, and uh, the two of us get together collectively with a number of other developers, including John and Daryl and most of the core team, work on this idea of like, how can we take WordPress or the actual website and make it better for you? Um, and there are so many different ways we can do that. A really first good way is the plugins directory. Um, we need to be better at this. There are so many things we can do with the plugins directory that we really just haven't gotten there yet. How many of you actually have a plugin in the directory? That's a lot of things. That's going to be a really impressive number of things. How many of you have a theme in the directory? In the themes directory, okay. Cool. Um, there are so many different things that we can do with plugins directory. I think probably our biggest focus right now comes down to the plugins need to be safe and they need to be secure. Uh, there's a lot in the plugin structure that happens. I tried following every single commit. Uh, I got to like a week and I wasn't sleeping. Uh, it was like 15, 20, 30 an hour changes going into the plugin. And there's 15, 20 thousand. There's so much going on. Uh, and so like some of the things we can actually do is we can do, a, a, we already do code scanning, but we can actually get much, we can uh, increase our intelligence with that. So we can actually scan through code, look for problems, and actually, you know, try and fix things. If we notice a, a plugin that is using an insecure library, we can actually let every plugin know that's using that library, hey, we need to update this. Maybe we will just update it for them. Uh, we can also do things um, with, uh, with better metrics. Uh, actually, going back, to, going, back to, going back to code scanning a little bit is that we can also start to identify bugs in code. We can actually look at like basic and secure code. We can, through searches and, and through parsing PHP on our own, we can actually come up with, here's a, here's a bug that many people seem to have. They're using this function wrong. They're not properly escaping this data. We can actually find all of that and dash email every plugin offer that does that wrong. And then we can check back and wait and see how many of them have fixed it. Maybe reach out to them individually. You also can other things. We can say, hey, just let you know, on line like 67 of this plugin, you need to escape this, this server value. Because otherwise it's just going to be insecure. Here's an attack vector. You might try it out on your own. Um, we can do all these really, really cool things. Um, and I guess, so on top of that, with the versioning, right? So we had those four plugins that were broken. 
if we improve plugin versioning and it's more intelligent so we know where it's compatible, where it's not, and Core can act on it, we can go in and see that you know a certain plugin is not compatible. We can go into the directory and say this is not compatible for sure, and your solution will say when you update, you know, warning, this this plugin is not compatible. Are you sure you want to update? And then you know, hopefully you do. And if the plugin isn't necessary, and then the plugin is disabled, and your site doesn't break. So the next thing I guess is better measure <coughs> finding the right plugin. I had one applause. I would like a few more, but that's okay. <laughs> we haven't done it yet. Let's do it first. Uh, this idea that like when you search for a plugin, how can we better rank the plugin? Maybe we can, you know, we do it by downloads and title and keywords and description. What if we also did it by like the number of sites that's actually up? We can do that. How many sites is it activated on currently? Uh, maybe how many other plugins does the author have in the directory? Maybe the quality of those plugins. How do we judge the quality of those plugins? Maybe it's based on the author. So we need to trust the author methods. So something along the lines of, you know, if you contributed to WordPress core, if you were a feature for WordPress, I would tend to think that you would probably write pretty good code. You can be trusted. Your plugin can actually even keep it up a bump or two up, depending on what we're actually doing. Uh, when I look at a plugin to inspect, the first thing I look for is all. That's because I know a lot. That's not fair to 50 million users. They don't know a lot. They, but I would like to somehow take whatever information I have and he has and everyone else out here and actually kind of push that one step further. So, you know, if the plug is written by like Alex King, you know, or you know, who's Alex King versus like my brother Alex? Like really just there's a big difference there in the code quality, just throwing it out there. Uh, and you know, all these different things like uh, so there are support requests that you could submit for a plugin, right? You could submit a support request. What percentage of the support requests have been closed? How many of them are resolved? Is the author you know, is the author uh, is it is it timely? Uh, we could do things like having mailing lists for a plugin. We can have that. We're actually going to hopefully start with a single. Like every plugin will have a mailing list. And now it's like, how much conversation is actually happening on that mailing list? Maybe there are multiple committers on that plugin. There are multiple developers working on a plugin that actually, in, in many ways, can improve the code quality just based on collaboration alone. It also, it also lessens the likelihood that that plugin will be abandoned after a year, or after a few months, or after a week. Uh, so there are all these crazy ideas that we have that we can like, possibly do this. What about like work you have attended? Why not? This idea of like profiles. So, you know, you know, your profile, I have a badge, like I attended working at Boston in 2011 and 2012, if all goes well, hopefully you're here. Uh, I, you know, spoke at WordCamp Boston. I organized WordCamp Boston. I volunteered at, I sponsored. Uh, there are all these different ideas like how we can make profiles better and how we can actually make that turn into a lot of different metrics for helping users then find the right plugin. All these different ideas that we can do. Maybe we'll actually do them. Uh, so, this mentioned that we want to have developers who are collaborating on plugins. That sometimes there might be multiple committers. And like we talked about earlier with the debug bug, this is a great example. We have you know, probably seven or eight people with commit access to that plugin. We have plugins that can extend that plugin. And we just collaborate to do whatever we can to make it better for any user. And we want that to happen. We want people to be able to work together. We want to provide tools for developers, whether it's track installs or better ways to manage you know, patches and communicate via SDN. If you want developers to be communicating and making things better, then it's important. Stop it. Stop it. Um, I think, you know, there is, there is a good SDN for support. Uh, there is a good mirror. You could do it. Ultimately, uh, I think the workflow of Git, in terms of like just the general idea of forking that kind of workflow, definitely helps with plugins. But I think there are a lot of tools that we could do to, to increase collaboration based on our existing infrastructure. I think there are a lot of things we can do. I think there are a lot of things we can maybe explore. Um, I think the cool thing about the, the, the biggest goal with us, I think, with plugins is that the more authors, the more collaboration we have for plugins. I would rather have like one awesome Twitter plugin than seven thousand that are crappy. We have like seven plugins right now for the Google Plus plugin in one day, then it was announced. Um, there are the, the plus one, rather. There are all these, I mean, I want, I want one that's great, or maybe like five that are great, that's fine too. But we want a lot of people working together. It goes back to finding the right plugin, but it also goes to, you know, something like the debug bar. Really, really cool plugin. Uh, and it has, you know, 
seven or eight core developers were working on it. We actually didn't get any work done at all in January at our summit because we were just working on this budget. Uh, not entirely true, maybe a little bit. So, uh, and, and so there's all these different ways of like uh, you know being able to, to build on more tools that ideally can come. Internationalization. Many of you don't speak another language. This, this, this plays a lot better in the international crowds, to be honest. Um, that's okay. The, the point isn't for you, know, you to be doing this. It's for you to be given the right tools to do this with others. And so a great example is that if you know how to internationalize a plugin, and there are plenty of tutorials out there, many, many more, on using get text, using the right functions to do it, it's really not that difficult. And now suddenly, what if we made it so easy to internationalize a plugin that if someone wanted to translate your plugin into French, they click a button, takes them over to Black Press that I was talking about earlier, they're able to translate the entire thing, it gets approved by one of the administrators of WordPress French, and now suddenly your plugin has French. Done. <laughs> Nothing else you need to do. Uh, this might not seem very important to you, but two thirds of WordPress users are international users. That's a huge number. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's just, it's, it, in many ways, it goes to the test of the platform, the flexibility of the platform. But so many plugins and themes are internationalized, not even close. If we can start educating developers on how to do this just a little bit better, there's, just, there's a lot we can do with just ideas like this. Imagine the idea of just a language pack that a plugin can just set, like, I'm running French. And now suddenly, uh, you know, someone has pushed a French update for this plugin. I just get it. I don't need to worry about it. The plug off doesn't need to worry about it. There's so many different things that we can do here. Uh, and I think, actually, for this, the language packs idea is something that we're hope that if all goes well, we're slating for 3.3. So at the very least, the B1 of this version, of this, of this idea, will hopefully come out in the, next, in the next six months. This is a big one. Documentation is pretty much everything when it comes to developer who's learning. I mean, if someone replies, just read the source, yes, the source is great and will tell you exactly what something does, but if you don't know how to understand the source or if you're confused by it, it's not helpful. And so we need good documentation. And ultimately, right now we have the codex, but we've got grammar codes. We, we, we shouldn't have any more. It's hard to maintain, and we can do so much better. Really, so this is actually a plugin that, that yeah. someone has written that that generates codex documentation. Why should that bother to be a plugin? Why should it be generating wiki pages? We can actually take that further. So we're hopefully doing two different approaches here. This is kind of an idea. First one is curated handbooks. Five or six handbooks. So plugin developers, team developers, network administrators, users, core contributors. So, you know, we can actually have you know, dozens of articles that, are, that talk about, like, here's how to use the HTTP API. Here's how to use WP Query. Here's, like, broad strokes. Here's how to write a secure plugin. Here are the different things you need to know about that. And then the opposite of that, we take those, and then we can cross-reference them to the API reference tools. This idea of why do, we, why do we have a plugin that generates codex documentation we can have scripts that just generate documentation. We've actually been working in kind of hard on this over the last few months. It's this idea of, you know, we can just scrape the core. We can look at, it's actually relatively easy to do, but we can actually look at the inline documentation, what function that function calls. So you have, you know, WP Query, that's actually a really crazy one. But there are a lot of these different, a lot of these different functions that might call 10 others. And we can actually take all of those and cross around the all. The, this function has all these filters. Many of you have probably used Adam Browser's database. Why does that need, why can't that be on WordPress.org? We can have that. We can do all these cool tools. We can do all these, you know, we know the code base better than anyone. We can build these tools that can actually help you to be able to, you know, understand this a lot better. And we can improve the documentation in the code base so that the tools understand where it is. And then you can say, all right, oh, this API has existed since here. Oh, this is deprecated. I shouldn't be using it. Oh, there's a better way because there's an example right here on the page. A good example. Which can also not always happen. Uh, and it kind of takes us to like, kind of like a final thought of like this idea of like federated.org. Uh, WordPress 3.2 actually uses quite a bit of WordPress.org, believe it or not. 
Uh, if you actually go through the different sections of WordPress, it's all over the place. If you go in and install a plugin, or search for a plugin, that's all coming from WordPress.org. You do the theme search, theme install, it's coming from WordPress.org. You go to the credits page, it's actually pulling everyone who contributed to WordPress 3.2 from an API on WordPress.org. Your update all comes from there. Uh, the, uh, the browse happy actually uses WordPress.org that way, you know, if there's a bug in the, in the user agent parsing, which there always is because everyone reports themselves as Mozilla, uh, we can actually fix that. We can actually adjust this so we can make changes on the fly. Um, and it kind of comes with this like new idea of like a federated.org. What if you could just go to .org and just manage all of your installs? What really stops us? What stops that? Not a whole lot. It's kind of like the next logical step. Not V1, not tomorrow, but like eventually that is a logical step. You can do that. We could do that. Why not? And of course, it could be opt-in. You want to keep your site off. Of course. You know, because there's always someone who says, no, no, not me. That's okay. That's why we're flexible. Things like WordPress.com, you actually go in and you want to go ahead and you know, manage all of your dashboard. It's quite easy to do. We can actually do this on a you know, on level. It could be pretty cool. What if you can update and install just by clicking a button? Or you can not see which of your installs are out of date. Why did I say update and install by clicking a button? The install should just update, right? Kind of went back over that earlier. Like, you shouldn't need to click a button. It's even better. Um, and so we kind of get to this next idea of like, it's your turn. And not only do we want to hear from you with questions, and hopefully some ideas, but also I think we really hope that this talk has gotten a lot of you thinking about contributing. And not just directly to core, to code, but of course there's documentation, there's the support forums, there's internationalization for the few of you that might you know, be fluent in the language. There are a lot of different ways you can get involved in WordPress. Uh, and, and in many ways, that just involves coming to a work camp and talking to people. And, you know, organizing a local meetup for those of you who are maybe not in Boston, maybe your city doesn't have one. Uh, and these are just all these different ways to get involved. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, I mean, that's our talk. Uh, I would, we'd like to take some questions if there are. Or ideas. Yeah? Uh, do, you, do you have a plan for improving the documentation? Specific to plugins, yeah. as in. Well, uh, sometimes, sometimes the documentation for a plugin will be uh, less, less than ideal. So it is possible at some point to have it so that uh, you can submit additional uh, documentation for a plugin. Because a, a lot of times you know, there will be plugins that don't explain uh, and, and, and have, you know, how it works. That would be interesting. I think a lot of that comes down to the idea of like, better collaboration. So a mailing list, the ability to like actually contact a plugin author beyond just like submitting something to support for them. Being able to have all these different communications going back and forth. There are a lot of plugin authors. Many people who are here that would be more than willing to take that back and be able to go with it. I think in many cases, like our plugin details page aren't good enough. There's a lot more we can do there. We can, we can redesign them. We can do better things with that. We can have more information about a plugin. We can have like, a full list of support friends. Uh, there's a lot more we can do there. So I think I mean, this is certainly an idea. I want to definitely make sure we can improve the, I want to make sure we can improve collaboration or plug in code and also core documentation. But that I kind of like the, the next step after all of that. On top of that, the uh, documentation parser for, you know, that we're working on for that automated, automated reference, that could just as easily be applied to a plug as a good or a theme. And so if someone follows, you know, whatever stack ends up coming out of it, like, which is not too complex, then all of a sudden their plug in is docking. And they have this whole system in which you can go through it and really learn. Well, on top of that, too, is like, the, thing, the thing that makes WordPress documentation good are the users that go back and download it. If all of the core contributors and core developers were also the only individuals that create documentation, it would also probably never be done. Absolutely. So when you, so, have, when you have bigger plugins or when you have plugin developers that are the only contributor to that plugin, they can't really easily flow. So yes. it's, it's up to the users of those plugins to help contribute that documentation back to hopefully whoever the author of those plugins are. Yeah, we, need, we can't document all of four on our own. That's right. We have a lot of people who just actually contribute documentation. <coughs> and that's perfectly fine. I mean, especially if they're a mistake because that's also really important. I think you're right. I think there's a lot of things that we can do to probably make that a lot better. You know, to submit, whether it's inline documentation or actual like support documentation for a plugin. 
Uh, and you know, if, especially you know, if you if you really tear apart a plugin the way like Wes and Mark were talking about earlier, there are a lot of different ways that you can contribute back. Whether it's just that you know the, the little filter and feeper feeper plugin or anything else. And ultimately, I mean, contributing back is a little bit of a game You can contribute to plugins, you can contribute to plugins. We just want to make it easier, especially on the plugin front. And documentation falls under that thing just as much as anything else. The back. Yeah. It seems like most of uh, or most of the fundamental principles of the talk today are really around user experience and communication and, and just you know, making the interactions between all the people at the table here more crisp. One of the things as a plugin developer that's been particularly frustrating because it's my goal to help people when I decide to share things with them, obviously not to just break thousands of sites when something doesn't go right. One of the things that's been challenging is like I'm unable to give like an upgrade notice. Like, hey, if you're using my plugin in this way, you're screwed and you need to like take the following steps to not be screwed. So is upgrade notice going to kind of take shape anytime soon? Because so there is an upgrade notice for plugins now in the region. It's not very good. Uh, we're actually thinking about ways to maybe improve the, the core update notice. I would love it that you know when you update to like three four or something, you actually are able to see a change log in the admin and you say, hey look, we're missing all these cool features. By the way, here's a link to our video, because I mean let's face it, the videos are kind of cool. Uh, and you know we can do all those different things with that. You know, maybe you know if we're actually getting to the point where we have change logs that we're using for core, we can make that API a little better. I mean, so you currently use it, but you also use them on your own too. So you can use the upgrade notice and it shows up on one page, but it doesn't actually show up in, on the plugins page. And so there are some things we can do there. Why not add it also to the plugins page? Why is it only on the update page? So there are definitely some things we can do there. I mean, a lot of it's actually really small. You already have the ability to send an upgrade notice as a plugin, so why not? You know, we can make that better. Does that make sense? What I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, you guys mentioned the plugin separator. Why is it like a word to roll out as a easy plugin for your dot org? So it actually has been. Uh, if you go to WordPress.org, it's said plugins PL upload.
Uh, yes, that's going to happen in three things. So that was mentioned yesterday. Frederick said he wanted it. It's happening. Period. <laughs> code, was written in, code was written in like two months ago. It's going to happen. Child themes in the repository is the question. It's going to happen in 3.3. Period. Done. How's that? What are your thoughts on grandchild themes? Uh, I think child themes can be unstable. So I really don't know about like grandchild themes. So. <laughs> <laughs> it can be really tough for updates. Part of, it, yeah. so part of the issue with grandchild themes is it, it kind of states a bigger question, which is dependencies. And until we have better version of it, so like we don't have those conflicts, like we can stop a plugin from updating if they have the wrong version, or you can find a theme with the correct version. However that is, you know, we can't do that much inheritance. Because then things can break because we can't track what's stable, what's not, what things require. I mean, requirements are very specific. And as a developer, you should generally know what versions of whatever you're building something requires. And so once you start going down and further down the line, um, you get increasingly unstable. It's nice so much So we have, I think, about five minutes left, right? Yep. Sound all right? Five, ten minutes. How many, uh, are you all questions? A few more hands up? Yeah. Um, I'm not a developer, and I am eternally grateful to all of these people who are writing WordPress plugins. Thank you. Well, so like, 
the idea about next gen is that we should have basic gallery management before that's better than what it is now. It doesn't need to be what next gen does, but it needs to be better than what it is now. Not everyone that requires heavy, heavy galleries like what next gen does, or it doesn't require uh, you know, the, the top level SEO like what another plugin might do. Or some sites don't even require a lot of performance plugins. So I think that, I mean, a lot of things need to stay as plugins. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think in many ways we can improve the ecosystem as a whole by not, you know, throwing everything into the code base. So first question. <laughs> yeah, pretty delayed, whatever. Um, so I think, I don't know, I mean, not everything needs, it needs to, in many ways, like 80% of the users probably are a big thing. I guess a quick second part of the question is, uh, if users have parts of the plugin that they really like, they are, is there a way to So we're going to have, like, you know, we have that ideas for them, and we're working on suggestions things as well. And part of it is that we'll look at plugins for inspiration, but we decide the scope of a release around when it starts. So we've just been working on what's happening in 3.3. And when it comes down to it, if there are plugins that do what we're trying to do, we'll look at them. We'll go through the code. I mean, but we did distraction for writing. We went through pretty much any plugin that had to do with it and all the other applications that did similar things. And then we said, all right, well, here's how we can do it. We can do one better here. We have to integrate with the tiny MCD. And sometimes we don't even have full plugins. And like with, um, when we were working on menus, um, we pulled in Bluefinch menus. And the thing is that, that they were developing something that was very similar to where we were going. Um, and they had a similar idea. But when we pulled it in, we rewrote the entire plugin. Like, literally, it's not a bad thing. thing at all. It's the whole point of iteration with code. There was nothing wrong with the way it worked. Nothing necessarily even wrong with their code in the sense that we just wanted to go different directions and how we wanted to store it. There was a really good basis to set us off in the right direction. And I think it happens organically. Or right. part of it is when you contribute to core, your code's going to be rewritten. That's part of open source is that you're going to add things, you're going to propose things, and they're, they might not be accepted. Or they might be accepted, and then they're going to be tweaked. But that's how we collaborate. Right? And it's not a bad thing. And it's not something to take offense to. And it's not something for, in the instance of plugins, looking at them and pulling into the core, that we don't, you know, we do it still. But are we going to very frequently say, yeah, that's what we want, we're going to drop it right in? Not as much. Not, not unless we're developing the plugin with the mind to put it into core, which is one of the ways we can fast track our development. But, you know, we still will take those things into account. Mark? So, some other ecosystems have uh, advanced uh, well, testing through I agree. unit tests, yeah. uh, behavioral tests, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, that's not something I've seen much of in the first No. Uh, and you talked about ways that the plugin directory can do code scanning and detecting and things like that to make guesses about whether or not something's being done the right way. But what can developers do to sort of demonstrate that the code works in certain conditions? I think first we need to get we need to work on our unit tests in many cases. There are a lot of features that we are not deliberately not touching with that unit tests. I know most pretty much every API we're writing now we have a whole series of unit tests that are going through. There are a lot of really like crazy regular expressions and whatnot, whether it's show codes or main clickable or things like that. We're making sure that we actually have full unit tests when we touch any of that. Uh, and I think overall, I mean, everyone wants a fully covered code based testing, and I don't think we'll ever get there. But I think it is to get it in that direction. We want to eventually have a web UI for the unit testing core. And so you know, we will put a patch that just goes through the testing. And why not? We can easily do that. So uh, I think beyond that, uh, for plugins, I mean, sure, you know, plugins can write the test time. Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, it's, obviously it's a whole different form of, of testing when you actually start getting plugins to test whether or not they're using core correctly. In many ways, you can, if you use a plugin like Log, log Deprecated Notices uh, by Andy Mason, uh, there is a, it actually spits out uh, deprecated notices and it will actually log them for you and use it in the development environment. And it will also even log things that are just wrong. We have a function in WordPress called doing it wrong. Kid you not. Uh, and we actually use it in a number of different areas. We're using more places. Where if you call a function incorrectly and you can actually track that, we're just going to say this was wrong. It's not deprecated because it was always wrong. We're going to tell you that. So I think we're working in that direction on testing and reporting and things like that. It's just going to take a while. There's a, a 
question there? Well, that was sort of a follow up to the one about whether certain plugins would be rolled into core. I think that a major okay, step that's to be taken would be to have certain hacks of plugins that do generate certain additional functionality, like all the custom post custom fields plugins in one camp, all the gallery ones in the other, but gotcha. have sort of curated um, sort of meta plugins, I guess. We can certainly have better groups of plugins, and we can certainly have more collaboration. I would love for, you know, People who work on you know a certain class of plugin to get together and like, create something that's awesome. At the same time, I don't know if anyone saw like XKCD the other day. You know, we have 14 standards. This is ridiculous. We need, we need one big standard, and then the next day it's like we have 15 standards. So part of the problem with that is you know with the number of plugins that we actually have, like I think it'd be really cool if like every plugin was a big collaborative plugin that served one specific need, didn't go crazy in terms of scope, and also like wasn't duplicated by others. But I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get to that. But, Necessarily one big plugin, but rather like an easier way to install plugins that work together, like whether they're cross linked in the plugin directory. So, so we've, we've talked about um, sorting the plugin directory, like having people say, you know, this is a caching plugin, this is a Twitter plugin, not just keywords, but actual kind of more like categories, um, and having a better way to browse plugins, right? So the, um, the WordPress.com theme showcase is a really like for if you're on WordPress.com, that's a great way to look through themes and find them. And our plugin repository should you know, be a little more like that, but even on top of that, kind of say, we have these big areas that you can look at. Maybe you want to add this to your installer. You're looking for gallery functionality. Check out all of these different plugins. Here are the ups and downs. And you know, once we have these better metrics and we can better evaluate the authors, the number of users, whether they're working, compatibility, all these things, we can say, you know, these plugins are this one, this one's probably what you're looking for. You know, maybe you're looking for an extremely light plug, maybe you're looking for something more complex. If you're looking to customize the entire admin, then Mark Jacobs, like that was a simple logo or a WP logo plugin, it's not for you because all you do is add an image to and it replaces it. It's like there's no there's not even an administration you add for it. It's just put an image there and it works. And it adds it to the login. Those kinds of plugins are actually really cool. I like it. Uh, a plugin that doesn't add an image screen that is a feature. <laughs> Flat out, that is a feature. Yeah. Uh, it really is. It should just work in that case. It should make the right decisions. It should do it. Questions? Anything? Wrap it up. We're done. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you.